presented by Historic Redeemer Lutheran Church in Elmhurst, Illinois. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In his farewell address to the disciples before his crucifixion, Jesus explained to them that now they were moving from the kingdom of this world to his own kingdom of light. They would no longer be counted as belonging to the world, as now they belonged to him. And the world would react accordingly. It would turn against them. It would fight them. It would seek their harm. Jesus told them, in the world you will have tribulation. And we do, don't we? We might not have tribulation like the apostles and the earliest church had. We don't even have tribulation like our Christian and brother like our Christian brothers and sisters in places like Africa today, where Christians are kidnapped or martyred simply for being Christian, like those in Nigeria just this past week. Or like our fellow believers in China who are driven underground by their atheist government. And although we rarely hear about it in our news feeds, the numbers tell the truth. That there have been more Christians persecuted and put to death for their faith in the last hundred years than there have been in the 19 centuries before it combined. And so it might seem strange for us here today, safe and sound, to talk about our own tribulations in the world. But our experience shows us that we do have our own struggles as those who believe in Jesus. It might not be as dramatic or outwardly evident as most of our tribulations are found inside. We constantly hear things that challenge our faith so often that it's hard not to internalize them. We face temptation everywhere we look often without even realizing the danger that it poses. We have doubts, fears, anxieties, all connected in some way to the fact that we love Jesus and believe that he came from God. And sometimes we feel so isolated, so alone in our belief, that it does feel like you've been scattered, each to his own home, like the apostles were that night when Jesus was betrayed, to struggle and fight by yourself. In the world you will have tribulation, Jesus says, pulling no punches. But blessedly, he doesn't stop there. He continues, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. It might feel like we're scattered harried, isolated, fighting on our own, but we know in faith, in these words of Jesus, that we're not alone. God the Father is with us. Jesus is with us. Take heart, he calls out. I have overcome the world. And how has he overcome the world with all of its might and pomp and power? He overcame it, he got the victory over it, through what the world considered to be his greatest loss. Through his cross, his shameful death in front of people who mocked him and lied about him. Through his death, he overcame the world, washing out all of its illusion, showing that the true treasures to be offered were not being given by the world, but by him. He shows its promises to be nothing more than a passing mirage, something that dies along with those who hold it. And in his sacrifice, he showed what truly lasts. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life, love, mercy, peace that passes the world's simple understanding. By his resurrection, he showed what will remain. Not the strength of the soldiers posted outside of his tomb. Not the authority of Pilate who sealed the stone. Not the threat of pain or death. Not even the power of the tempter. When Jesus rose, all of those things fell away like the passing shadows that they are. 
and he got the victory. And that victory that he won has some very real effects for us as we find ourselves living in this quickly fading world. Because Jesus has overcome the world, he tells us that whatever you ask the Father in Jesus' name, the Father will give you. Jesus' victory means that you have direct access to God the Father. We can hear him speak. He speaks through Jesus. He speaks in his word. And he leaves us no doubt whether it's him or someone else speaking. He speaks for our benefit, telling us that our sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that we're baptized into his name. And what's more, because we have access to him, we can speak to him too. We speak to him in worship, through the language of the liturgy. We speak to him in the divine throne room of heaven, which descends into this very space, along with the whole church on earth, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. We speak to him in prayer, making our requests and thanks known. And we can even speak to him in our sighs and tears. We can ask God the Father, and Jesus says, Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Ask and you will receive, that your joy will be full. Really? Whatever we ask? It seems hard to believe. Too good to be true, doesn't it? And yet, this isn't the only time that Jesus has made this promise. Through the prophet Isaiah, he said, Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. And he taught the crowds in the Sermon on the Mount, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul teaches, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. So, what does this mean? Obviously, there are some things that we should not pray for. We shouldn't pray to sin. We shouldn't pray for those things that we know are against God's will. But for anything else, God the Father only has three answers. The first answer is yes. When he gives us what we've asked for, immediately or almost immediately. We've all experienced this at some point. And we all experience it every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. The second answer is, I have something even better for you. That's when God's wisdom provides something that's greater than what we've asked for. Something that we couldn't have foreseen. Something that we wouldn't have even known to ask for. And the third answer, the third answer that he gives us to our prayers is later. When we're called to wait in patience and hope. Knowing that what we've asked for will be given, but in God's time. Now, these answers might not always be easy for us to hear, but notice that he doesn't answer no. Jesus tells us, whatever we ask, the Father will give us. Now, we might not get it right away. We might have to wait, even until our Lord returns and makes all things new. Or we might receive something even greater than what we've asked for. But God the Father wants us to ask so that we can receive, so that our joy may be full. So what's the catch? 
What would God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, care about a single individual out of all the people who are living, who've ever lived and who ever will live? Why would he care about the requests of someone who is, by our own admission at the beginning of the service, sinful and unclean? Well, it's precisely because of Jesus' victory over the world that we already talked about. His victory over all of our tribulations, temptations, sins, and death. In his victory, we're made holy and spotless. We're made important to the Father. We receive it as a gift through faith in his name. And so now there's nothing standing in the way of the Father's good graces. God the Father himself loves you. I think that too often people think of God the Father as being the distant one in the Trinity. We think of Jesus as the one who's closest to us. He walked our world. He shares our human nature. We think of the Holy Spirit as being there, but he's a little bit too mysterious for us to really get close to. But God the Father, all too often, we think of as being a distant, indifferent judge, sitting on his throne way up in heaven. And because we think of him so distantly, we tend to color him with our experiences of those who are far removed and distant from us. Many times people think of God the Father as doing what he does, creating and sustaining, only because that's his job. He does it because he has to. He does it because it's who he is. It's his duty, like a distant caretaker who works day in and day out. But Jesus puts all of this in a new light. By shining the light of his victory on the cross and in the empty tomb, Jesus shows us that the Father doesn't do these things because he has to. He doesn't create you and provide for you because he has to. He does these things because he wants to. He does them because he loves you. He tends all creation because he loves you. He made you and nurtures you because he loves you. The Father loves you in Jesus. He's given you his only begotten Son. And so that shows us that there's no good thing that he'll hold back from you if he's willing to give you that treasure. So go ahead. Your father loves you. He's listening. So ask him. Ask him whatever you need, however daring, however improbable, however small and mundane, however great and noble, whatever. He loves hearing from you. He wants you to trust him enough that you can tell him your needs and wants. And he wants to give them to you. And you know that whatever you ask in Jesus' name, trusting that he loves you because of what Jesus has done for you on the cross, that whatever it is, he'll give this to you. It might be now. It might be later. It might be much later. It might be when he returns on the last day. He might have something even greater, something that you couldn't have even thought to ask for, but he will give it to you. So yes, in this world you will have tribulation. You'll have need, fear, angst, temptation, You'll face disease, depression, and death. You may even face persecution and martyrdoms, little or great. But take heart. You're not alone. Your Father, who loves you more than anything, who loves you more than anyone else ever could, is with you. He sent His Son to be with you. Take heart. Ask receive, and your joy will be full. In the name of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.